All right, this will be your first official lecture for 4401. Uh, this is going to give a generalized overview of the class, some key terms. So it might be a little boring for anthropology majors that have already glossed over a lot of what we're going to talk about today. However, I think it is important to start off at the foundational level and build up as sort of the focus of this class towards the greater whole that we will get to hopefully sooner than later uh, in terms of terms you feel comfortable saying um, in your papers and in your other work as well. As a reminder, any material on these PowerPoints, on the readings, on the videos, on the podcasts, whatever, that I provide are fair game for the quizzes. So keep that in mind and take notes. A bit about me, because it's also beneficial to know your professor despite the context we find ourselves in. My name is Devin. You can call me Instructor Gray, you can call me Professor, or just call me Devin. It doesn't really matter to me. I'm not a doctor yet. Hopefully I will be uh, in the near future. I'm in my PhD right now in the Medical Anthropology program here at USF, as well as pursuing a Master's in Public Health degree at the same time. So I'm staying relatively busy. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm a medical anthropologist, which basically means I study both culture and health and basically how these two concepts interact with each other to create different uh, contexts and scenarios that influence health and people's perceptions of their own health, as an example. I primarily focus on health inequalities. So for instance, environmental inequalities that can shape mosquito burdens in affected communities. So on that note, my research primarily falls within the country of Belize, which is about a two and a half hour flight from Florida. Uh, so pr pretty close to us. It's a very small country. It's smaller than, I think, almost every state, besides the cluster in the Northeast, maybe. It's a small population as well. Um, so what that means is when there is a disease that impacts the country, given the small population size, it kind of skews the data and makes it seem like there's a lot of cases there uh, relative to the population size. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to look at a site that was declared to have endemic Zika virus, which is a mosquito borne, as well as <clears throat> infectious disease that can spread through sex, through biological female to fetus, as well as through blood transfusions. So endemic basically just means that a disease is thought to be in an area presently and most likely will be in the foreseeable future. So I wanted to explore that endemic declaration essentially and what that meant on the ground for affected communities. I'll get into that later, but basically I study infectious diseases as my area of focus in particular with a hyper-focused lens on mosquito-borne diseases. Broadly, and I do mean very broadly, anthropology is the study of humans and what makes us human. Basically, if it's something that humans do, anthropology can study it, and oftentimes they do study it. So we take a broad approach to understanding and researching the many different aspects of the human experience. This is called holism or holism. Basically, taking a holistic perspective, as I mentioned in the syllabus uh, lecture, is basically looking at individual pieces and how they connect to each other towards a larger whole. So if I'm studying human culture in Belize, I should probably look at multiple different aspects of what that actually means, from their economy, to their religion, to the food they eat, to the music they listen to. All of this builds up to what is called Belizean culture, essentially. However, culture is a very amorphous term, and it can mean different things to different people. And Belizean culture in Key Cocker Island, where I do my research at, it may be very different from Key Cocker in the mainland or towards the Maya side of the country, as it's called, on the western and southern border of the country. So it's important to acknowledge that in our research and to also look what that might mean in the United States as an example. So America, United States, is a very large country, of course, and it has been said that basically there's individual statewide cultures. In a sense, that is true, but also there are more micro cultures or subcultures, we call them. 
So for instance, if you are using Instagram, you are participating in Instagram culture. At the same time, we all collectively make that what it actually is. It's not there by default. When Instagram was made, there was an Instagram culture. But humans interaction with this new form of social media and technology built up towards there being certain phrases that are common, hashtags that are used, how you post your pictures, what stance you are when you're taking photos, how many photos are acceptable to post at one time. These all are part of Instagram culture and, a, and to a large degree they are unspoken. You just learn it as you go. And that basically is the approach to culture that anthropology takes. It's not something you have when you were born. It's something that you are ingratiated in over time. You learn what is behavior that is accepted. You learn what not to do, taboos, for instance. That largely is the work of cultural anthropologists. In the United States, because this is not uniform and in different countries, there are different forms of anthropology even, you can sort of place anthropology into four separate subfields, we call them. One is cultural anthropology, which is the largest of the subfields. It primarily deals with living humans and how they interact with each other. So for instance, if you're looking at individuals in a village in India and how they interact with gender and power dynamics, that's very much cultural anthropology. Linguistic anthropology is the smallest of the subfields, and oftentimes it gets kind of gobbled up by cultural anthropology. Linguistic anthropology primarily deals with language. To an anthropologist, language doesn't just mean the spoken word or the written word. It can even mean sign language or use of emojis, hashtags, coding when you're doing computer coding. These are all languages, and you have to be somewhat proficient in them to be able to participate in discussions, essentially. <clears throat> but language also has with, embedded within it cultural dynamics. There are certain words that cultures use that get baked into a language. And in the case of a language dying, as it's called, there's a portion of the culture that is lost too. Different ways of thinking, different ways of understanding the world, essentially. We'll get into that more <clears throat> later in the semester, but basically linguistic um, anthropology is very useful. Uh, it is just the smallest of the disciplines. It's really tough to do linguistic anthropology, but it's also very much a necessary component of the overall discipline, I would say. The one that most of you probably are most familiar with is archaeology, and that is primarily dealing with the excavation and archival work of remains, whether they be objects or human remains. This class is not going to focus much at all on archaeology, but it is important to at least point it out so you know of the overall structure of the discipline, essentially. A lot of archaeologists, in fact, kind of don't like being boxed in as an anthropologist. And for instance, in the UK, archaeology has a very distinct and different history than anthropology in the country. <clears throat> Biological anthropology is perhaps considered to be the most quote unquote hard science of the anthropology disciplines. They primarily deal with long dead remains. So for instance, our human ancestors, so excavating uh, fossil specimens. And also they deal with uh, non-human primates. So gorillas, apes, and other forms of primate life. And they kind of do comparative analyses to see for instance, okay, what maybe we developed and evolved from can be seen in our very close, in terms of genetics, cousins. Additionally, the, the most well-known face of biological anthropology is forensics, so forensic anthropologists. They oftentimes are hired to be, for instance, a examiner in the case of a murder, as an example. You may be familiar with the Casey Anthony trial. Uh, there was an anthropologist at the University of Central Florida who basically was the one that would go into the field and was hired as a consultant, essentially, uh, to look at the remains and do an assessment, as they call it. Um, again, biological anthropology is not going to be the primary focus of this class. I would say, in general, this class, you should expect to be 
focused on cultural anthropology and also linguistic anthropology to, to some extent, but primarily cultural anthropology. And I do split these up into different categories, but these subfields are not very rigid and there is, a, there is room for some cross-pollination essentially. So for instance, a lot of archeology span is starting to pull from cultural anthropology. A lot of linguistic anthropology is starting to be developed and folded within cultural anthropology. But anthropology and anthropologists like their subfields and their titles. So for instance, I could say I'm a medical anthropology specialist with a focus on infectious diseases. And I'm also a critical feminist anthropologist and also a political economic anthropologist. Those titles, don't worry about that. We'll get into those later. But just know that anthropology means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. The individual that is most often attributed as the founder of American anthropology is Franz Boas, who himself is a very interesting character. And he held many degrees before sort of settling on anthropology. He was a big advocate as an immigrant against scientific racism of the time, at least, because it never really has gone away, primarily through craniometrics, what essentially was a practice um, over a century ago, essentially, uh, of measuring the cranium size and circumference of different individuals, so so-called races, basically. It was thought and promoted at the time in very bad science that the shape of someone's cranium could indicate their, their average intelligence, essentially. This had been used, even since the time of slavery, to basically justify, to some extent, uh, the thought at the time that white Europeans were intellectually superior than other races, primarily black Africans. Franz Boas uh, was a big advocate that this did not really tell you anything at all when you were measuring someone's um, cranium circumference in terms of genetics. What he found actually is where you grew up had a big influence on your cranium size. So for instance, immigrant children that grew up from parents that uh, had left their original country to the US developed a different head size compared to their parents. Franz Boas found out this is largely due to nutrition. So nutrition and lifestyle, basically the debate between nurture versus nature, can be seen even in our head size. And you can even think about this more basically in terms of body size. Um, nowadays, contemporar contemporaneously. So for instance, BMI scores, which again, don't really tell you a lot, uh, they are going up. Americans are getting bigger because of their food. This also applies to our heads. This does not mean that those that have larger heads or larger skulls or craniums are more intelligent because the brain actually is starting to fold on in on itself and maybe even get smaller but more dense. These sort of folds may be a better indicator if there is such a thing as intelligence in the brain uh, compared to, let's say, in a, another skull. But cultural anthropologists argue that what we call intelligence, so for instance, when you take a, an IQ test, this does not really tell you how smart you are compared to anyone else. Your upbringing will influence that to a large degree. If you give someone in a very rural area an IQ test, let's say they, they are uneducated, they are going to perform worse than someone that has had a good education. The person with a good education is not more intelligent necessarily than the individual living in the rural area. They just have had an upbringing that is easier for them to be able to take a standardized test. Therefore, they look more intelligent on paper. Additionally, uh, Franz Boas was a rejector of what was thought at the time as cultural evolutionism. Basically, cultures evolve and become more complex over time. This also had been used to justify racism and expansionism in the West because it was said that we basically, we as in white Europeans, 
were doing native communities a favor, quote unquote, by colonizing them and educating them and making them more Western. There was thought to be basically different tiers of cultural evolution. And of course, because they were the ones that were participants in this culture, white Europeans saw themselves at the apex of cultural evolution. This is not to say that cultures don't change. Evolution does not necessarily imply up or down, but that's how it was used. Cultures don't devolve, they don't evolve, they just change over time. There is no less or more complexity to our cultural anthropologists between one culture and another. They just have different historical contexts that shape their current practice today. This leads to what's called cultural relativism. Basically, this is the belief and the stance one takes that one culture is not inherently better or more evolved than another. They are just cultures. They are there, essentially. This is a cornerstone of cultural anthropology, anthropology in general, and cultural relativism is going to be the stance that I'm going to try and have you all take when you are reading the articles that I assign you and also when you're writing your papers. Basically, in summation, cultural relativism basically says I'm going to take a stance that I'm not going to make any value judgments on another culture based on my own cultural ideals. This is called ethnocentrism when you do that. Again, the word holism or holistic. Holism basically just means, again, I'm taking a broad approach to something. This does not just apply to anthropology, it can also be a word you use in general practice to say that I want to look at all the different pieces and not just focus on one thing. This is why anthropology is such a broad discipline, because we, we take a holistic perspective. That's why we have multiple sub-disciplines like archaeology and biological anthropology, linguistics and cultural anthropology, because Franz Boas at the time advocated for we need to fully understand all the different components that make us human to be able to understand and make assumptions and theories based on what it means to be human. A factor of that is a term that he coined called historical particularism, meaning we must understand the history and context of a culture in order to talk about it. He did work in Alaska among the Inuit communities and one thing that he found was that a lot of their language, a lot of their practices could be traced back in their own history. So when a white European was looking at Inuit communities, they saw that they were in their mind primitive. However, Franz Boas says, no, they're not primitive necessarily, even though he wrote an article called The Primitive Man, basically the, a sort of a play on this to say that they are just as complex as our own culture. There's just a different cultural historical upbringing that they have that is distinct from our own. There's difference, but we are not more or less evolved or really different from them in that sense. When you are thinking about a culture, think about also what got them to that point, basically is what Franz Boas and anthropologists are trying to advocate for. I already covered this in part on our previous slide, but since again, this is a cultural anthropology class primarily, uh, even for those that are non-anthropology majors, I, it is important and useful to go over some of the foundational sort of understandings and concepts of this sub-discipline of the larger body of anthropology. So primarily we're looking at similarities and differences among living societies and cultural groups. We do what's called cross-cultural comparison. What are they doing in Belize and how does that compare to what we're doing in the United States concerning, let's say, COVID-19 responses? One thing that's actually interesting is, especially in, let's say, countries that are close by to each other, so let's say in Latin America, oftentimes you'll see similar patterns because there are similar cultural aspects in such countries. And that can also apply to the United States that has certain blocks basically of cultural groups or ethnicities that have generalized similar practices, basically. These can help us when we're doing analyses because we can say, okay, we're seeing a pattern here where these amount of cultures are doing X while over here, there is some, something different going on 
and we should explore what that actually means, basically. So, no aspect of human life is off limits. There are anthropologists that study sexuality, religion, health, natural disasters, policy, food, basically whatever. There's nothing really off limits. People study BDSM culture. People study medical anthropology in clinical settings. People look at different ways to integrate anthropology into public health and linguistic practices. Really, there's nothing that is off limits for us However, we do have a code of ethics in American anthropology that does restrict some work that an anthropologist can do. So for instance, anthropology has a code of ethics that does not allow us to be uh, deceptive to participants. So we can't willingly lie about the intent of our research. While in some disciplines, it is accepted and maybe even encouraged that you be duplicitous to some extent, like in psychology, for instance, when you're doing a trial, because you're trying to get at something. Anthropology tries to be upfront about our research methodology and approach and intent, which does restrict, for good reason, some of the work that we are able to do, essentially. Now, cultural anthropologists in our past, because we largely grew up as a colonial discipline, uh, studied social groups that often differed from our own, because in, insights are often generated by an outsider trying to understand others. This is still what we see today. I go to Belize, and my perspective as an American anthropologist going to Belize is different than a Belizean anthropologist when they are studying their own culture. One's not inherently better than the other, but you get different answers and insights depending on your own positionality when you're doing research. That leads to the next bullet points, and this is something that anthropologists are increasingly starting to do right now, which is study your own culture. Before there was a taboo about studying your own culture, it was somehow considered to be academically incestuous in a sense, and that you would be basically blind to, to what you were seeing. Because a for, right, for good, rightly reasons that has been found in the science, when you go study a different culture, you notice things that another individual in that culture may take for granted and not even think about. They may say something that you think is interesting or even problematic, but they think it's just what you say in a given context. However, there's something also to be said about being ingratiated within a culture and also studying it. This is what a lot of anthropologists do now. I'm sort of in the old school of going abroad just because that's just how it worked out for me. But there are plenty of anthropologists that go back to, let's say, a, a trailer park that they grew up in and go to do work there. Or an anthropologist that wants to study local dance culture in Tampa Bay. None of these are invalid or less than versions of anthropology. They just get you different answers and you find different things and insights as a result. Going a little deeper, when anthropology goes to do research, let's say in Belize, we call this doing fieldwork. Fieldwork is a relic of the time when we were again a colonial discipline going to some exotic location with a basically just a notebook or a recorder and starting to learn a culture and understand them essentially. Now, that learning and understanding was later called thick description. Basically, we want to be in that culture for a long period of time to fully understand that culture. If you're only there for a few days or even a few weeks, you really are getting at the surface level dynamics of a community. It is not until you are there for an extended period of time that you really start to understand the nuances and unspoken truths that everyone just sort of participates in and acknowledges without saying so explicitly. So on average, anthropologists like to be in a certain area as long as possible, really. Some anthropologists spend multiple years or months, in, in the case of a PhD, in a certain location. So individuals, so for instance, community members can start to understand what you're doing there. They can feel comfortable talking with you. You can learn the languages and the local nuances in terms of linguistics of a given community. So. Anthropology as a discipline that values fieldwork is very different in some senses from, an from a different discipline like sociology or public health that likes to go in there and, for instance, give a survey when they're doing their research. Now, 
I say that, but to be fair, public health and sociology are starting to do more what we would call anthropological field methods, including using field work. Now, the larger body of anthropology methods are largely called ethnography. Uh, essentially, this can be broken down into three components. The first is participant observation. Now, I will give you an example before I really define it, because I think it's easier to understand it doing so. Participant observation, or PO for short, basically is hanging out in a community, doing what the community members are doing. When I'm in Belize, hanging out basically with community members, uh, local guys, for instance, I hang out with them, I do what they do, so they get comfortable talking with me, I can observe their behavior, that's the observation. The participant portion of this is, as opposed to being like a scientist in a sterile lab coat watching somebody, I am enacting and interacting with community members in their daily lives. It's supposed to be more organic, essentially. So individuals feel more comfortable talking to you, they feel like while you are doing research with them, you're not doing, just re doing research on them, in a sense. A portion of that is also called naturally occurring conversations. When you are doing ethnography and you're doing personal observation, you're talking to people. That talking is data if you write it down and you memorize it. When I am talking to somebody about Zika virus in Belize, or for instance, why men in Belize largely don't like to use condoms during sex, I can get at a more base understanding of what they mean when they say, I don't like wearing condoms. This can get into discussions of machismo, it can get into discussions of masculinity and the, the thought that somehow wearing a condom makes you less of a man that I found in my own research from talking to participants that you wouldn't really get if just giving someone a survey and you might not get it also when you're doing an interview. It's more natural, essentially. That leads to interviews. And interviews are also a very big part of anthropology. Uh, this can take in many different forms, which we'll get into later, but basically the ones that I want you to really know in terms of interview methods are called semi-structured interviews and structured interviews. In terms of the former, this basically is you're given a series of questions that you have. It's not a strict script, but you are also able to have some flexibility with it. So let's say I have a questionnaire with 10 questions and I'm talking about condom use practices with men. The participant may start to go off on even tangent about why he doesn't like wearing condoms or he doesn't like being expected to wear a condom. And I can facilitate that and keep asking him follow-up questions that aren't even on the paper in front of me. It's what the, the apologist is seeing the participant wants to talk about. It's more, again, organic, and you can get really interesting findings you wouldn't get from a more structured questionnaire that you can't deviate from. This is more qualitative research, which I you see at the bottom is more looking for themes. So if you're talking to, let's say, 30 men, and they're all starting to sort of gravitate towards certain themes when they're talking about condom use practices, you may be finding something really interesting here that you wouldn't have gotten if you just had a structured script that you as a researcher and also the participant must adhere to. However, there are a lot of merits for um, structured interviews as well. They're more useful for even quantitative sort of measuring frequencies and demographic information, that sort of thing. So whenever you're doing a, a survey or you're getting interviewed, these generally are structured because that uniformity is really useful so that you can say, okay, 30 men responded with this answer on this question out of 100. That's a sizable amount of the population that is saying basically the same thing. So there are different reasons to use different kinds of interview techniques. Most cultural anthropologists gravitate towards semi-structured interviews because for the most part, cultural anthropology is a qualitative discipline. Now, to expand upon those a little bit further, if you're unaware or don't feel comfortable using these terms, quantitative basically is counting. How many respondents said X, opposed to saying Y, as an example. These are really useful, and so are demographic questions. So for instance, race, ethnicity, age, gender, status, those questions can also help you 
start to establish trends in the data that you're seeing. While qualitative data usually is very heavily script-based and text-based, so people giving very long answers to interviews is a good thing. It's very time-consuming to transcribe that. So for instance, to write out what someone is saying on the fly while also making sure they feel acknowledged and that you are paying attention to them is a very hard thing to do, especially at first. So you usually get very good at writing in shorthand. And it's a general rule of thumb that when you're doing an interview like this, that you immediately rewrite all the notes right after an, an interview is over. So you don't lose anything. You can quickly start to lose valuable data if you don't transcribe as soon as possible. To give another example of my own research, on the left here, you will see the vector control vehicle for Key Cocker Island, Belize. It essentially is a pickup truck that also is the island's dump truck during the day. Basically, in Key Cocker, it's a very poor island in general. They're a tourist location, but they don't get a lot of money. This, uh, that's just a thing that's also common in Belize in general. Essentially, uh, during the day, this truck serves the village council as the garbage collection slash dump truck for the islands. They go around and they collect garbage. Now, when they are told by the village council that they should spray for mosquitoes to fumigate, they will offload the garbage and onload the fumigation machine. Uh, I rode around with them during participant observation as basically an observer to see what they are doing when they are fumigating and how do I see people on the island reacting to the fumigation. So I sat in the back of this cramped uh, truck, basically in a sideways seat, which you can see on the right. I am very hot and also very uncomfortable, but it is part of the experience essentially. So I very much valued my time and also interacting with and hanging out with the vector control guys uh, during my time in the island. So we would ride around for about four and a half hours every time we fumigated uh, during my time on the island. And while that was happening, I was having naturally occurring conversations with the men in the front about the work they're doing. The, do they think it's effective? How do they think people react to the fumigation? Do they think it's even worth it to fumigate? While that was happening, I was logging our route, essentially, so I could then map out later using my other methodologies, basically the route they take from point A to their final location at the end to see if there's any disparities and where they spray um, and if they could be doing a better job, essentially, at their, at their job, in a sense. Additionally, I was looking out for islanders and also tourists, because again, it's a tourist location, to see what they would do when they saw the vector control vehicle. So generally, what an islander would do when they saw the vehicle is walk away very quickly or even pull out a rag out of their pouch or their pockets and put it over their face. This is a learned behavior for them. They know what to do when they see the, the fumigation machine on the back of the truck. A tourist that may be unfamiliar with the practice, sometimes they would even follow the truck, which I thought was very interesting, um, or they would give it a wide berth. So different people that have different expectations about what you should do in a given context can be seen in something as fundamentally simple as driving around in a truck on an island, essentially. That's a very small example from my research, but I just wanted to highlight that as you can see a sort of real world example of what doing observations can look like for an anthropologist? Because there really is no one answer to that question either. Now we get into linguistic anthropology. Um, I may say I am a huge fan of linguistic anthropology. I, if I wasn't a cultural anthropologist by discipline, I probably would be a, a linguistic anthropologist. It's a very difficult discipline, but also extremely useful. And it's a cornerstone really of the larger body of anthropology quite literally given as a, there is four sub-disciplines for good reason. That being said, linguistics as a field is not exactly the same as linguistic anthropology. And we'll get into that. But basically linguistics and linguistic anthropology study similar things, not always the same, but at their base value, they are looking at words and languages and sounds essentially. So 
to get into more specifics in terms of what anthropology really hyper focuses on, there are two terms you should be familiar with. The first is semantics, which is the study of meaning in language, including analysis of the meanings of words and sentences, quite literally what a word means. You can think about this in terms of a definition of a word, which ties into pragmatics, which is the study of language use, of actual utterances of how meanings emerge in actual social contexts. Basically, semantics is, here is a word. What does that word mean? Pragmatics is an individual saying, okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to use this word as opposed to this word. If you called me Mr. Gray, as opposed to calling me Professor Gray, there is an inherent power difference in that statement. If I am in the classroom giving a lecture, you give deference to me because I am an instructor at the front of the classroom. You are trained and learned as a behavior to raise your hand to ask a question. And when you do ask a question, you're going to frame it in a way different to me or another instructor as you would, let's say, a peer or a close friend. When you're talking to a friend, you may use more colorful language than you would feel comfortable using with me. That is you making a pragmatic uh, decision with the words that you're using. Now, a, a, a linguistic anthropologist, why you chose to use a certain word is perhaps more interesting than the structure or the meaning of a word, as an example. Additionally, languages influences, influence thought, and thought influences language, while both influence culture. So as an example, largely in the United States, France, French is considered to be a romance languages. It is considered to be both exotic, but also romantic in a sense. However, to someone that is proficient in French as a language, they may find that to be an, an, an interesting distinction. And there's nothing more inherently romantic about French than there is English or any other language, essentially. This is considered to be a language ideology. We put ideals on certain things, including different languages. We'll get into language ideology later on in the semester, but how we think about words influences basically every aspect of how we talk to people also too. And that means these are gonna have an impact on culture because culture is the interaction between us on a daily basis. Again, apologies for anyone interested in archeology. span You are effectively in the wrong classroom for that. But to give a brief overview, again, very brief, probably criminally so, archeology span is the study of our collective and shared past through material remains, artifacts, structures, and also living remains, including those from animals or humans, as an example. Archaeology, uh, I can say because I have also have a small background in archaeology, is a lot more boring than Indiana Jones. You often are digging through ancient garbage, quite literally. They just call them something more pretty, like a refuse pile or um, detritus, essentially. Uh, but garbage, humans make a lot of garbage, and that never really has stopped, is a great way to understand culture. When you're looking at garbage, let's say, in the Turks and Caicos Islands among the uh, now long gone Tayano um, indigenous communities, you will find similar things than you would find in a garbage pile in the United States, just with different technology, for instance. You find animal bones, you could replace that with chicken wing bones as opposed to hutia, which are small rat bones. You find tools and other items that were broken. Basically, humans haven't really changed over time beyond just the technology that we have access to, essentially. That's one of the merits of archaeology, is to say that we've all been human for a very long period of time. We just have this extra trapping of technology that we kind of have around us and we interact with. Studying the past allows anthropologists to find similarities and differences between us and back in the day, essentially, and in this time period. It helps us also to be holistic and practice historical particularism. Again, two words that Franz Boas was a big advocate for. 
Franz Boas also was an advocate for archaeology. Uh, when he was studying Inuit communities, he realized that one way to understand their history was to look through the archaeological remains to see, okay, how have they changed over time and, and how also have they largely stayed, stayed the same over time too. Again, brief summary, but also very important. Biological anthropologists seek to understand how humans adapt to different environments, a big key term there, what causes disease and early death, including through forensic research, and how humans evolved from other animals. So to do this, biological anthropologists study both living and dead humans, as well as other primate species, and our past and, and present as well. So. To give an example, I mentioned forensics, I mentioned primatology, but biological anthropologists also study primarily nutrition, but also other forms of human development over time, as an example also too. So for instance, from the time of the fetus all the way through adulthood and into an adult's older age. To give a more specific example, there's a lot of work now on what's called the developmental origins of health and disease hypothesis or the fetal programming hypothesis. And to give an example of what that means, when a biological female is pregnant, her environment, again, keying in on that key term, can have an influence and consequences on the health and development of their fetus. If a pregnant woman experiences malnutrition, the fetus is going to have some complications potentially as a result of that malnutrition. The environment of the womb, in a sense, is impacted by the environment of the biological female. Now, when that fetus starts to develop and grow into an infant and into an adolescent, into an adult, let's say they are a biological female also, and then they get pregnant. The environment of their mother her malnutrition impacted their health. And then additionally, when she becomes pregnant and develops a fetus that turns also into an infant, that infants, basically their programming from their grandmother in, the, in this scenario has impacted their own health and development as well. So there is a generational component to this essentially, where the environment of an individual can impact the next generation, and then the next generation, and then the next generation, basically creating a cascading effect of health consequences and development consequences over time. This is a burgeoning area of interest for anthropologists, as well as other health specialists, including medical doctors and public health specialists. So I will be delving into these theories with you later on in the semester. And basically, yeah, biological anthropologists have shown that while humans do vary in their biology and behavior, we are more similar to one another than we are different. So biological anthropology first was a proponent of creating racial categories. In more contemporary times, they are the ones largely refuting racial categories. We'll get into what it means to be a social construct very soon, but essentially anthropology takes the stance that there are no biological bases or foundations for creating separate racial categories. We, in a sense, are just the one race of human being, essentially, at the biological level. All right, this is not a quiz, so don't freak out. However, I would like you all to be able to have answered these questions in the event that there was a quiz because who knows, these questions may appear later on. Additionally, uh, just so you have an idea of what the quizzes in this class look like, they generally are true, false, multiple choice with a few essays at the end. That's really about it. So as long as you feel comfortable with the key terms and ideas and theories that are introduced in this class, you should do pretty well on the quizzes. So just go through these for a second, just make sure you can list them all off. The last one is just, so you, you remember my name when you were sending me an email, because oftentimes you'll just get, hey, professor. So try not to do that, but I'm pretty lenient with what you call me. Just know in general, especially for other professors that care more, uh, try to use them their preferred name and or title when you're sending them a message.
It is important to note that anthropologists largely can't agree on many things. Uh, some disciplines, including the so-called more hard sciences, see this as a weakness of the discipline, but uh, many anthropologists actually see it as a strength. That discursive process of debate and questioning underlying assumptions really is what makes anthropology great, um, at least in my definition of what anthropology is, as well as many others within the larger discipline of anthropology. However, that being said, public health and the biomedical sciences, and also just biology in general, largely have a more centralized message of sorts that they all generally prescribe to. So there is a lot of contention uh, between the so-called harder sciences and anthropology, which is considered to be a more softer science, or not even a science at all, depending on who you're speaking with. However, anthropology, again, would argue that we very much are a science, except it's just that when you're dealing with humans, it's going to be a very messy process. And you can't rightly or accurately fit humans into small boxes or models. You can try, but really you're just making extra assumptions, and this can quickly become biased depending on your own perspective. So there'll be a lot of situations that you may not agree with the perspective that I'm saying. That's totally fine, but just know that's what I am conveying to you is the current science of the time that is generally accepted um, within the larger field of anthropology. But also know that there are those that disagree with what I have to say, including within anthropology. However, that area of debate and contention really is room for growth for the discipline. Anthropology is a discipline that prides itself on being able to adapt to new developments within the field. And Hopefully, you as well when you're taking this class. As this is a foundational lecture, there are some terms here that I just want to make sure that you feel comfortable using because I will throw them out every so often and also you'll see them in your readings. So first of all, most anthropologists prescribe to certain research paradigms or basically points of view about human nature and or culture. So, to give an example, my research paradigm is critical medical anthropology, or CMA. So breaking this term down, critical largely just means that I am looking for ways to improve an existing system or to identify areas that I think are weak in a certain system. So CMA is a large field within anthropology and also within medical anthropology specifically, of course, given the name, but essentially what I do is, for instance, when I'm in Belize, I am looking at how the system largely fails to adequately address and assess Zika virus and dengue fever as endemic diseases in the country, largely due to inadequacies in testing services and economic capital that individuals have, given that it's a relatively poor country, as well as existing systems that largely shape the ability for individuals to seek family planning services. So as an example, abortion services are really hard to get in Belize. They're not technically illegal, but given all the loopholes that you need to navigate through to be able to get an abortion in the country, this largely limits the ability for family planning to take place in the country. This stance is based within the science that shows that when you limit abortion services, this does not limit abortions. They are just found clandestinely or illegally, which can be very dangerous for the pregnant individual. So from a public health perspective, public health largely advocates for reducing restrictions on abortion services because it is a better health consequence as a result because individuals are able to seek services in areas, in clinics, in sterile environments with trained professionals, essentially. So how this relates to the Zika virus is Zika can cause a cascading amount of different complications, including in the fetus, such as microcephaly or congenital Zika syndrome, it is, as it is largely called now. But focusing on microcephaly, because it is the one that is most well-known consequence of the Zika virus, essentially results in the small cranium size of the fetus or the infant, which can have developmental consequences as they are developing. 
the Pan American Health Organization, which is basically a sub body or partner of the World Health Organization, when the Zika virus was was in everyone's mind around 2016, 2017, released a statement basically urging countries largely in Latin America to lessen their, their restrictions on abortion services because the thought at the time was that individuals would need the ability to seek an abortion if they found out that they may have a, a fetus affected by Zika virus. Additionally, it was thought at the time that if a individual that is seeking an abortion can't find so legally, they will do so illegally, as it has been found again and again and again, which is incredibly problematic in areas that make abortion really hard to access while also urging individuals to not get pregnant. For instance, in Belize, the government urged individuals in endemic areas to postpone or not get pregnant. How do you do that? Family planning services. However, it is difficult for individuals to, for instance, use condoms because condom use in Belize is very low due to cultural factors as well as economic factors. Additionally, it's really hard to seek an abortion. So you're telling individuals to not get pregnant or to postpone pregnancy, but you don't give them any options to do so. This creates a double bind for them where they're not really sure what they can do and what their options are. This is where CMA sort of enters the picture and says, okay, here's what's happening on the ground. And here is what got us to this point. And that largely is due to structural and economic factors that shape the potential for individuals to make healthy decisions. So a part of that paradigm, think of a paradigm as a larger umbrella and then theories sort of fall underneath that umbrella. So two theories, actually three, the the three theories, my apologies, that fall within CMA generally are political economy of health specifically, there, are also, there is also just political economy, re, uh, reproductive governance and syndemics. I'm not gonna go into these theories here because I will do so at length in a later presentation, but just know that theories fall within paradigms and every anthropologist and every theorist really has a paradigm that they generally prescribe to. Some scholars are very comfortable switching paradigms depending on what they're trying to do, while others more rigidly fall within one paradigm and largely do not deviate from such paradigm. However, for a theory to be useful in research or analysis, it must have good data and research to support it. To be able to get that data, you need to be able to do a literature review to see what's already been done, but also you need to be able to do primary data collection through a rigorous methodology that is also based on the scholarship, so they can be tested and verified by, all, by other scholars as well. All right, so theories inform the questions that we ask and also how we explain our findings. A certain theory can have a cascading effect on what a researcher is looking at, as well as how they interpret the data that they have in front of them. However, to get to that data, Anthropologists generally use a research question, which is different in form and function from a hypothesis. So a hypothesis is one that you probably are most familiar with, and it is an assumption or a claim made prior to research, which is tested. So as an example, I have a hypothesis here. Giving food stamps to poor communities in Tampa will increase access to healthy food options compared to poor communities without food stamps. The assumption here is that if you give food stamps to individuals, they will likely access food to a higher degree than those that do not have access to food stamps as an alternative means to get food. This assumption here is often what is called rational actor theory, which anthropologists largely uh, are critics of because we have found that humans don't always act what we would consider to be rational. So as an example, and give you my hypothesis, what may turn up is that individuals that get food stamps don't like to use them because there's a stigma behind using food stamps. When you're in a grocery store using a food stamp, you may feel that you're being judged for using one. So the hypothesis may not even reflect reality because the researcher assumed individuals are hungry, so they will go get food stamps and then they will go get food because that will satiate their hunger. 
However, individuals may value their social status and their perceived self-worth more in this scenario, which may influence their ability to use food stamps, essentially. So in contrast to a, a hypothesis, research questions ask different things, essentially. Uh, they, they do not try to make claims, and they are usually broader than a hypothesis is. Think of hypotheses as very narrow. They're looking at maybe one or two variables, while research questions seek to understand the larger picture of what is happening. One is not inherently better than the other. They just find different things, and they shape your research differently depending on how you're using them. So to give an example here that is slightly different from the hypothesis on the previous slide, I have two research questions. One is what are experiences in Tampa communities concerning barriers to nutritious food? And two, which barriers are of most concern for participants? So what this does in contrast to a hypothesis is that it asks a broader question that it leaves the participants able to answer differently and not as narrow and focused as the previous assumption that they will use food stamps to get access to nutritious food. As an example, some barriers people might, might state are there are no grocery stores by my house. I don't have access to public transportation to get to a grocery store. I can't afford to go to the grocery store. I don't like using food stamps because of the stigma behind them. Or I don't even know how to cook using the foods in the largely Western grocery store that I have access to. These barriers may never have been found if you had just asked the research question of what would happen if I give people food stamps, would they get more food? Essentially, it's just a more broad, more time consuming in, in terms of the researcher and the design of the project. But again, you can get more quality, qualitative data with it. All right, we are reaching the finish line. We're not there yet, but there are some other key terms here that I think that you really should know when moving forward because you will see them all the time in ethnographic and anthropological writing. The first is the other, which I mentioned, I'm pretty sure on the syllabus um, presentation, but so you can have it in writing here. The other with a capital O, when, if you see that capitalized is not a typo, that's intentional, are basically people whose customs, beliefs, or behaviors are seen as different from your own. So usually when someone is saying you are othering somebody, you are making that person alien or different from you. This is seen as a negative thing. Humans largely are the same. It's just the cultural trappings that we all prescribe to and grow up within manifest in different ways of speaking and behaving, essentially. There is not one culture that is more advanced. There's not one, one, there's not one culture that is less advanced. That's the general idea, essentially. But when you are othering somebody, it is a form of ethnocentrism, which is the next term here, which is viewing your own culture as more important and correct than another culture. You are being ethnocentric if you do this. So, for instance, if you are saying um, female genital cutting, which is the practice of removing some areas of the uh, labia or the clitoris for the female, is a wrong primitive practice. Public health specialists largely take this approach. However, to an anthropologist, this approach may also be ethnocentric because you, we don't understand the customs and cultures that developed this practice, despite the health consequences. Not saying you can't say, I think this is wrong from a human rights perspective or that this is unhealthy, but we must, we must understand cultural practices within the context of that culture. We do things in the United States that some cultures may find also incorrect. So for instance, we also practice circumcision for infant males in the United States. There are, are, um, there are both religious and secular reasons for doing so, but additionally, think about it from this perspective, that infant could not give consent to have their penis circumcised. So in a sense, how is that any different really from a young adult woman in a country elsewhere from also getting circumcised? Especially considering a lot of the individuals doing the, the, the circumcisions on young females are also female. 
So just keep that in mind, and we will get into that subject later on. It's a very useful topic in terms of exploring ethnocentrism and othering individuals um, in anthropology. So I'm kind of alluding to this, but enculturation is another key term here to know, and that's the process of acquiring the characteristics of a culture or group by being immersed in it over time. When you grew up as an infant or a child, as an adolescent in a certain country or culture, you learned things that influenced how you behave and see the world and your expectations of how others should behave as well. And part of enculturation is also language socialization. This is the process of acquiring language through acculturation. For me, as an example, I grew up in an English speaking only household, like the majority of individuals growing up in more affluent areas of the United States. However, that has limited my ability to speak different languages. However, there is a thought in the US, despite this being problematic, that you should really only need to know English in the US. That is a language ideology to refer to a previous slide here as well. Now, in terms of it being a socialization process, you grow up learning how to speak a language and also how to speak the culture in a sense. So when you are thinking about that in terms of why does someone speak a different way than I do, think about how they grew up in a different environment than you did. So I said I was gonna get to this and here it is. However, you're probably not gonna be satisfied with what I have to say. Anthropologists who largely are the ones looking at culture have a really hard time coming up with one definition that everyone is satisfied with. So I will give you two that have very different ways of thinking about them and also how they are operationalized. The first one comes from Kenneth Guest, a well-known anthropologist who likes to make textbooks for introductory students. You'll see his name sometimes where he says, culture is a system of knowledge, beliefs, patterns of behavior, things, and institutions that are created, learned, and shared by a group of people. Now, I italicized and bolded the last part of this, a group of people, because again, culture is something that you participate with other people in. So when you are interacting with someone on social media, you are interacting within that environment of that social media, but also that social media is embedded within your larger culture of being, for instance, a student at the University of South Florida. So it is something that you participate in, it's something you build together with other people, and it is a system of beliefs, patterns of behavior, so how we think about how we should behave, and also what we actually do as well as the institutions, which could be, for instance, USF in general, you as a student participating in classroom discussions, us going to a doctor's office as opposed to a midwife when we are trying to um, deliver an infant. These systems of our larger cultural body are what makes a culture, essentially. However, Culture is also information in your head in the form of expectations of what other people will do, what the physical world will be like. I keep saying expectations, so I wanna hone in on that word. Basically, when you walk in the room, let's say a classroom, if you actually were meeting in person, you would act a certain way. Implicitly, you know to sit down at a desk and wait for the instructor to start talking. Why do you do that? I didn't tell you to sit down. I didn't tell you to wait patiently, and you know that you are not supposed to talk while I am talking because of the power differences between me as an instructor and you as a student. That is in your head. That's the value expectations you have of how you should behave, and also how others should behave and talk with you, and vice versa, really. So in a sense, culture is something that you make yourself on a daily basis because you wake up and practice that culture but you also practice that culture with other people. So it is, it is both a group activity and also an individual action and way of thinking about the world. So that very messy definition that basically says, well, everything is culture. Yeah, 
<laughs> that basically is it. Everything is culture for an anthropologist. Everything we do, say, act, feel, as a member of a larger group of people is culture. And we shape it, and we enact within it, and we are also shaped by it, essentially. I mentioned here Maderos and Cowell you are reading for this week. I don't think their definition is very sufficient, so that's why I have these two. Uh, Geiger is another anthropologist from the University of Central Florida, and I latched on to his definition of culture because I thought it was very salient and palpable and crunchable as a definition. But again, culture, just know it's both something you make and also you participate in. All right, so this was taken from a previous semester that I taught this course, but what you're seeing here is a word cloud, which if you're unfamiliar, the more times a word is mentioned, the larger it is. It's a good tool when you're doing uh, research with human populations because you can see patterns in the data. So basically, I asked students, what culture do you think you belong to? And interestingly, the, the majority of students said they are a part of the American culture. What does that mean exactly? Think about that for a second before you go to the next slide. All right, so what do I mean when I say American culture? It is a hard thing to really pin down. Maybe even pause this and think about what it means to be an American. Everyone's definition may be very different. You may think about life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, Maybe think of the American dream, but even that can mean different things to different people, and that may not be their first assumption either. Then think about what the average American looks like. Can you do that? I would imagine, based on previous experience, that I would get very different pictures of what the average American looks like. Does that match with overall demographics? Is that what you are used to seeing in your everyday life? If you can, think about the, the definitions of culture I've just given you and try to apply them to your life in the United States. Do you participate in a group, groups, a larger body, maybe USF, maybe Florida, maybe the South, maybe the United States? These are going to change, most likely, your definition of American culture. Is there one culture? Is there one way of doing things in the United States? I would argue, and anthropologists would argue, that of course not. That's because we are a very diverse body, which I think is an amazing quality of living in this country. But not everyone shares that opinion. So think about that as well, and how that can shape how people interact with each other. And what those interactions can do in terms of consequences, both social and in terms of also of health as well. All right, the last slide, you made it. Some things here I want to leave you with, some final thoughts. Remember that culture is information stored in each of our heads that influences how people interact with each other. That's a good base definition to work with here. You belong to multiple cultures at the same time. So remember, your USF student, despite being most likely fully online at this point, you're taking classes, using your Instagram or your Finsta, depending on what you use it for, and your interactions with others influencing your different types of cultures and those that you interact with. Thus, culture changes over time. So one example I love to give because I think it is thought-provoking is when you're in a classroom, generally now I would say more often than not, women or those identify as women wear jeans more than men do. However, if you go back in the history of wearing jeans in the US, women and biological females for a long period of time were not supposed to wear jeans in a sense. They were stigmatized for doing so because it was male fashion in a sense. However, over time, this practice has changed and now it is very common and no one really thinks about women wearing jeans. That's something to easily latch on to, yeah? That's basically how an anthropologist sees cultural change. After a while, it just sort of develops that way through discourse, through debate. And then after a while, it just sort of becomes the new norm, essentially. Think about that in terms of how at first 
COVID-19 was probably a very large shakeup for you. In a lot of senses now, as people say, it is the new norm to take classes online. This is how you do classes now in US, USF for the foreseeable future, despite the, the university trying to promote hybrid models or transitioning back to campus. That's gonna change the cultural dynamic and also the, the, the dynamic of the classroom, as well as people have different expectations of what it means to be a student in the US in general now. Again, I wanna emphasize that this does not mean that cultures evolve. We're not progressing towards anything. We're not getting better or worse necessarily. We may develop in certain situations or contexts, including let's say some social justice or LGBTQ plus um, issues and other motivations, including so for instance, the right to have a marriage if you are um, gay or lesbian. That is a development, I would argue, for the better. However, this is not the U.S. culture evolving. This is the U.S. culture changing. And not everyone shares opinions that this is a good thing. So we cannot argue or say that every American thinks the same way because they don't. That can be seen in politics right now. So just keep that in mind when you are thinking about culture and when you're making value assumptions about how a certain culture is doing something differently than you perceive your own culture from doing. Hopefully this all makes sense and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your week. See you next time.